Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Uncommon Comedy Podcast. I am your host, Brian April, and uh, this week we have a, a great, great show for you. Before we do that, uh, be sure to check us out on uh, Instagram and YouTube and on Facebook, uh, Uncommon Comedy Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook at Uncommon Comedy Podcast. You can follow us on Instagram at Uncommon Comedy Tour and on YouTube at Uncommon Comedy Podcast. Uh, we're going to get right into it today. Uh, we have an amazing guest. He performs all over the globe. He's uh, extremely, extremely funny. Um, one of my favorite comedians that that I've gotten to uh, to meet and work with. Please welcome the very funny James P. Connolly. James, how are you, sir? <laughs> Wonderful my, to have you. Brian, this is my, I love a podcast. There. I say, we got a great show. But first, I love that <laughs> opening moment. It's, just like, it's like, you're not going to believe what we're going to do. But before we do that, here's something for <laughs> I have a story about that because I okay. was doing a show at Vitello's in Studio City. And I love Vitello's, right? It's that Wendy Lieben does a show that's very swanky. It's that supper club vibe, right? Mm -hmm. And so they asked me to, to do a New Year's Eve show there and I opened for a Tony Award winning singer. And I was like, oh, I'd love to, right? So I get there. And I'm all excited. And everybody's decked out. And then um, the owner, I think it was the owner... He's like, ma, these guys are going to, okay, ready to go. He's like, all right, they're going to love, they, they have no idea. A little surprise. And, they, and I go, surprise? I'm like, am I surprised? He goes, oh, yeah, they don't have no idea. And he walks out there and he's like, hey, New Year's Eve. Or he's like, ah, are you guys ready to see Tony Ward running singer? Yes, we love him. That's why we came. We only want to see him. They go, all right, uh, well, a little surprise for you. I brought a comedian. And you hear the crowd just like rumble, 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 rumble. <laughs> and then in the back, this one woman goes, boo, 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 boo. <laughs> and then he introduces me. They're so pissed off. And I just say, well, it is such an honor and a privilege to be here. I've always dreamed of being introduced as, but first. <laughs> so, whenever I hear but first, I'm like, it's like PTSD with me. That's so funny. That's the first time I've done that, actually. Usually I just go right into the show. I don't I don't promote the social media or anything. And you led me in. You led me into a horror story. Right? <laughs> That's great. I like that. So how's how's things going for you? Doing all right? I am surviving. I was just I know we were chatting before this. I was uh I did a Zoom show last night, so I've jumped into the uh the digital world of performing from my living room to yours. So uh and it's been really, you know, it was really uh I really enjoy the opportunity to connect to people. I really do. I know it's different, but I mean, it turns a bad day into a good day for me. Just hearing people laugh or not laugh, even that's funny for me. Absolutely. And you know what? You can connect. I'm going to just go total. <laughs> you can connect with James P. Connolly. But first, yeah. <laughs> but first, you can follow him on Instagram at James P. Connolly and Facebook at James P. Connolly Official. You got the official. Level. I got the official because when I was doing America's Got Talent, you, know, you try to get all your, your social media handles the same thing. And then I couldn't because some people had some things. And as a civilian, if you try to call a social media company to get help, I mean, it doesn't happen. Right. However... If you ask America's Got Talent social media people, happens like that. Suddenly, wow. the I was just like, oh my. It's like, so that's what it's like to be treated like a human to have access to social media. <laughs> they just call, because, you know, they want the social media handles to work. So, right. so everything got smooth. And then that one, the only one I took official, because there's another, there's a James P. Conley that's like a, uh, award-winning set designer and so, you know. Not, not quite need, as funny. I don't need him <laughs> taking my audience. That's right. Absolutely. So uh, before we begin, I, I'm going to just keep throwing all these uh, prepositions in here. Before we do that, uh, no, <laughs> I, one of my have favorite. Have we started yet? Is this thing even? <laughs> we'll be 45 minutes in, and then. Uh, okay. no. but, but, what I, but what I really love, uh, what I really love about your your act, we I've gotten a chance to work with you multiple times, and what I really love is you. You are super funny. You are um, you. so smart. Oh. Um, yes, really. I am. You Very know, cool. intelligent humor and beyond intelligent. you beyond intelligent humor, uh, probably Super the most genius, intelligent. Yes, probably the just, most, yes. This, yeah, this intelligent. conversation boring the hell out of me. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm so <laughs> <smart>. <laughs> but no, I really love that. And you just when you're on stage, you just have this command and this presence about you. And I've just seen you walk into, you know, hostile rooms and uh, <laughs> tough yeah. room and just totally win them over. And it, it's, oh, thank it's you. just amazing and so i'm really that's one of the things that i i love uh, about your act and and uh, you as a comedian we, so. i appreciate that and that you know that took me it took me beyond years to uh to learn how to open up 
in a hostile situation. And it's helped me on Zoom. I was talking to a comedian about that. They asked me for my strategy. And I said, the strategy is to let go. Because if you don't let go, then what you got inside of you doesn't come out. And hmm. even in the worst room, there's no joke. There's no trick. There's no gimmick that will save you. What will save you is plugging in to your fear in that moment. And then that's step one. And I've learned to just te- go with the terror and start there. And because that's where you are and you can't hide it. If I pretend I'm confident, they're not going to know. So that it took me like 15 years to realize. So just panic, just panic. Just correctly. Panic. <laughs> panic correctly. That's what I did. It's kind of like when they say you're drowning, you just kind of embrace it and it's go with it. Just yeah. Yeah, relax. Right? <laughs> just it's a lot die, of work. die with dignity. Exactly. Right? Don't <laughs> don't struggle. Uh, so let's uh, talk a little bit. So how long have you been doing comedy? I've been doing comedy now about uh, ooh, I think 25 years. Okay. Like 25. And, and it's funny because when you start, you know, you're so proud. Like I've only been doing it four years. I'm like the boy wonder. I'm going to be the man. Yeah. And then. Now you're like, I am so proud that I've been able to do this for 25 years and still do what I do and still get to do it and hang out with some of the funniest, most talented, wonderful human beings I know. And I very proudly, with a little bit of gray in my beard, say that I've been doing this for 25 years. I'm proud that I have no other job skills. I am very proud that I am on unemployment because of it. And uh, and I'm working my way out. Because of stuff like this. This stuff like this is coming to us and we're able to slowly uh, have an impact in our living rooms. You know, I, I kind of agree with you. I've been doing comedy uh, almost 23 years myself. And so the only time I don't like it is when you end up in like a really horrible place, like a horrible room. And you're like, yeah. why am I here? And you just, you, whether you're working something yeah. out, someone's like, how long have you been doing it? And you're like, yeah. You're like, uh, I don't tell uh, you. Yeah, yeah, I've been doing it a while. Just but that's enough. the beauty of it is that you realize <laughs> if you've been doing it over 20 years, you realize that no matter how good you are, no matter how good your judgment is, no matter how much you attempt to filter out, you will yeah. still, at least once a year, walk into a room and go, what happened to me? How <laughs> did I get seduced again into believing that this could possibly be a good show? Mm-hmm. And now, but then the good news is now you have to dig deep and prove again to yourself that you possess what it takes to at least have some positive <laughs> thing come out of it and then never speak of it again. Exactly. exactly. You embrace that fear again. Embrace the fear just... and shower it off when you get <laughs> Very nice. So what uh, what inspired you or who inspired you to do stand-up? Um, well, I would say, well, as a kid, um, you know, my brother and I were huge stand-up comedy fans. And so we grew up in the 70s. You know, we had Steve Martin albums. We had Robin Williams albums. And we had, you know, my mom had Smothers Brothers. So we, we loved that stuff. We'd sit there at night with our little... Transistor radios on, listen to Dr. Demento and uh, love that stuff. But I didn't have the confidence. Like I was a funny guy, but I was an, I would say I was an appropriately funny guy. Like I'd pop off in class and stuff, but I didn't have that look at me, I'm funny. And in college, I had two buddies, my best friend, uh, John Klecker, he passed away a couple of years ago, and uh, another guy named Eric Poulier. And two, just two guys who were funny and smart and had moments of absolute fearlessness in which they would want to go do something like stunts in front of people. And they just wanted, included me. And I was like, I had, did not possess that, but they did. So I would do it with them. And so, but then they would be done. And I'm, I'm the one that was like, my God, we could keep doing this. This is phenomenal. <laughs> so honestly, the guys that inspired me were just two buddies of mine who really showed me that if you had a great idea and it was stupid and you just mm-hmm. went for it, uh, why not? Just give it a shot. And, uh, Cause I didn't possess that instinctively at all. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned uh, Doctor Demento. What's your favorite Doctor Demento song? Poisoning Pigeons in the Park. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Not a lot of people uh, talk about Doctor Demento. And the other one is they're coming to take me away. Ha ha! Hee hee! Ho ho! Mm-hmm. To the funny farm where life, where life is love. beautiful all the time, and I'll be happy to see those nice young men in their clean. Oh yeah. my god! Like we get Sunday, my mom's like, "You two go to bed, okay, mom?" Yep. And we put a little transistor radio yep. on Sunday night. We're like, "Doctor Demento, <laughs> Doctor Demento." Yeah. Love that. Song. Yeah, that's where I got introduced to uh, Weird Al and, you know, just so many, so cool. you know, fish oh. heads and dead oh, puppies. Oh, really, and... fish heads. I, yeah. had the, uh, I had the Dr. Demento, like, four-disc CD collection. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. I love that stuff. So funny. Uh, dead puppies was always just this bizarre. Dead puppies. Of course. <laughs> dead puppies are awesome. Fish heads, dead puppies. Yep. And if no one knows what we're talking about, they're like, what the heck's wrong with these people? But yep. these are the best. They were, were bizarre. 
Yeah, amazing, amazing song. So you should definitely check that out. And then they sometimes had like little sketches in there and everything. I yeah, it was the same thing. Sunday night, it was like six or seven o'clock at night. And, yep. And uh, Westwood One Radio and just you know go listen oh, in. Yeah. So that. good. And uh, Funny Five. Anyway, I love love Doctor Demento. Yeah, awesome. Check him out if you don't know any Doctor Demento. It's a lot of like Weird Al parody. But first. Things. But first, <laughs> have you ever noticed? No. Um, so do you remember your first show? Um, I do. I was, um, I started out as a mobile disc jockey karaoke host. And that was my half measure to, and I was getting paid too. Back then I was making like 25 bucks an hour. So I was like, you know, so, but I really, I did it for like a year and a half. I knew it was just a way for me to prove to myself that I could get up in front of people. And I really wanted to do stand-up comedy, move to LA. I was in San Diego at the time. And I was working with this company and they had a bridal shower, like a bridal show that they did at like the Anaheim Convention Center. And they had this mm. guy that always did it, but he couldn't do it. So the company was nervous. And so my boss was like, hey, I got a DJ. I think could do it. And so they hired me to do it and they made me watch him. It was very serious and it was a script and it was a co-host. And, and the whole time in my head, I'm going, I'm going to write some jokes. I'm going to write some bridal jokes and I'm going to do them. And they told me, whatever you do, don't go off script. And I'm like, nope, going to write them, <laughs> going to do them because I'm being paid now. And I thought, this is it. And so before I was in the back and I remember just pacing in the hallway and the guy that hired me is like, are you OK? I'm like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm just doing me- first time in my life. I'm just committing to memory of jokes. And I get up there and I remember getting on stage and the and the, I come out, say something. And, the you know, then the co-host, she walks out and she's waiting for me to say my line. And I dropped like three jokes <laughs> and they all worked. And in my and she's looking at me like you're off script. And in my mind, I'm looking at her going, I will never host a bridal shower again. <laughs> I was like, I am moving to LA. I wrote jokes and they worked in a bridal show. Come on, that was that was that was money. HBO, here I come next I week. Like that, yes. That's funny. I, I was also a, a DJ karaoke host, yep. uh, sadly. And that's where my uh you start to get those those vibes of just getting out there and being in front of people, getting that laughter and yeah. I think when you do karaoke hosting, you're either a wannabe singer mm-hmm. or you're a wannabe comic. Mm-hmm. Uh, because I'm a, I could carry a tune. I mean, you didn't really want me to, but if I had to, because I'd right. like, I would be the one guy ruining your dinner and Betty Hanna in the corner by the fish koi <laughs> pond, going, "Hey, fly me to the." <laughs> you want to sing? Like, no, we came here for Japanese food. So I did that, and then uh, I mean, I had other experiences with comedy and stuff, but that was my first time where I decided I'm writing jokes. I'm going to do the jokes about where I am. And I was specifically told not to. And I did the most <laughs> comic thing, go, no, I'm doing them anyway. And I will never come back here again. That's awesome. Yeah. I, I remember doing karaoke and it's just one of those things. You just learn to hate songs. Uh, there was people would come up and sing the same song. Like uh, oh, this couple, yeah. would come, this, these, these two women would come up and sing, grandpa, tell me about the good old days, which is yeah. not it, a very enjoyable song. Right. Is there nothing worse? than seeing a regular come back to do their song. It's just like, it sends, yeah. ch- and then, so what we started to do would be like, um, the guy would sign up for like, stare, whatever, and I'm like, sign man, scratched, disc is scratched. I did the exact same thing. I did the and, exact same thing. But then there was a guy, and he, oh, I forget what song it was, and he would always, really great voice, but then he had that one high note, and he always mm-hmm. backed off. He always pulled it way away, and had an emotional moment, and brought it back in, and I'm like, <laughs> You know what? I should say you can, you're not allowed to sing that song unless you can hit that note. You exactly. Come here and posture, and then back off the big note. The song is about the big note. <laughs> so funny. That's so funny. It, it's uh, yeah. I, I, I honestly, it was it was the same thing. It was stairway, and I would always just be like, oh, you know what? The the, the scratch. Sorry. It was, it's just so on the rose too. Oh my yeah. god. The rose. <laughs> stairway to heaven. There's. I had a list of like no. Wind beneath my, my wings. Yeah. yeah but, not on my watch. I said I've heard it too many times. <laughs> Even if you're good, I can't take it. It's just right. Yeah. Well, shifting back to uh, to comedy, um, how long did did things uh, take? F- uh, if I can speak, it's a good thing I don't do this for a living. That's the worst. Um, how long did it take for things to uh, click for you? You know, um, geez, I didn't. I hate to even answer that by saying things have clicked. Um, <laughs> I would say there were three clicks in my stand up career. Okay. Um, I would say the first one was I used to do a character. That's how I started. I had a character I did for like 10 years. And so that was the first time where I was able to like move from beginner to 
get on national TV. So that, when I realized the power of writing, my writing, I realized was good because I was writing for a character that I created and worked with the workshop and my former managers. And then the second click was the decision to abandon the character after about 12 years when I realized that I'd hit a wall and people weren't like, I would get hired to host on TV shows because they liked me, but then they were like weirded out by my act. And then they'd see my act and say, well, that's all he can do. He can't host. And so I realized, okay, if I want to have a career, I have to merge my stand-up comedy sense of humor with my natural sense, my humor. I had to become myself basically. Right. So that took about 12, 15 years, 14 years in where I abandoned what worked for me and I just changed it in front of everybody. And that was terrifying. Um, and then honestly, the third click for me was nine months ago. I've been really? sober for nine months and the sobriety and having to do Zoom, this has been like the greatest level jump doing Zoom because the one thing that I really needed to work on that I could get away with because I articulate very clearly is that I talk too fast. Hmm. And it would inhibit my writing because I could get away with a bad habit of filling the space with energy and chat. Still hit my beats, but it was a sloppy habit and I knew it and I had to get rid of it. And Zoom demands that you slow down because of the time lag. So you can't chat fast and you can't run over your jokes because you won't be able to do it. So because I'm sober and I'm not in my own way and because Zoom demands it, suddenly my 10 minutes now goes to 15 because I'm waiting and I'm writing tighter because I know that I have to be precise. And so, um, and watching guys like Kylie and people whose precision is perfect for Zoom. Yeah. So I would have to say, I mean, this has been one of the greatest like clicks for me. That's 25 years in. And I'm like, I finally have internalized a habit I've been told to change. My former managers used to say, slow down. And mm -hmm. no matter how slow you think you're going, slow down some more. Mm -hmm. That's basically communicating to me that I'm not the guy who decides how slow I need to go because I'm not <laughs> capable of it. But it took technology to squeeze that out of me because I have no choice. You can't chat fast in this format because of a slight lag and everything. So, yeah, there you go. Well, Three clicks, 25 years. That's really interesting. Uh, what was your what was your first character like? I'm curious. The character that was just a real over the top, um, delusionally self-confident individual so which is my right. sense of humor but it was played out in a, a really over the top tightened manner yeah. and you know one of my better jokes was you know when i make love to a woman and believe me someday i will it, just, <laughs> it was that type of right. misdirection and bombastic and it was fun but i was young and when you're young and you have this attitude like oh women love me but everyone knows you're you're, right. you're a disaster of a human. But then when you get older, I was very conscious of being that creepy guy. Right. You get older, and I knew that this character had a time, a shelf limit. Even my former manager and I, we were both like, yeah, this has got 10 years at best, and then it's going to get creepy. <laughs> so right. We were both very conscious of the fact that, and, but that was good that we were on the same page. So when I transitioned, it was because it was right for me, but I also knew that I've seen older comedians do characters that killed in their 30s, and there's something that gets lost. Uh, yeah. Sometimes. Well, when well, I think also, uh, it's one of the things that I see with a lot of comedians. It's they they talk about sex or they talk about whatever yeah. they talk about you know themselves sexually, and you're just like, dude, you're you're 50. Nobody wants to right. hear about your private parts. Exactly. So there's a when you're younger, there's right. that naive day of he this kid has no idea what he's talking about. It's hysterical. Right. But I agree with you. In your 40s and 50s, you're like, well, now this is obviously a choice, and it's right. creepy, and yeah, so. Yeah, so that was, uh, but it was fun to do. I mean, it was just, it made me, allowed me to walk into some terrifying situations and be someone else. And um, and I remember I did Ed McMahon's Next Big Star. And mm -hmm. it was like post-star search. And one of the producers of the show was George Slaughter from Laugh-In. And he was huge. And everybody was just like, oh, that's George Slaughter. And, you know, you know who he is. And I go, yeah. And so I did my set on the show. It went really well. I won that night. And I walked by. And he was sitting there and I never spoken to him before. And I was still in character. And he just looked at me and he goes, what the hell was that? And everybody froze. And I leave and I go, who the hell are you? And everybody exploded laughing and he <laughs> laughed. And it was like, that's what he wanted. He wanted me in character to push back. But I was just like, I was just like, but that's when you're like, oh, okay. So this character, I have the ability to be kind of a jerk because they know I'm an, it's okay. 
So it was fun. It was really fun. To, I was terrified. Though. I was like, this is an old guy coming at me. And he's like, right. that kid's got moxie. I'm like, that kid <laughs> didn't know what he's doing. He no clue who you were. <laughs> so you, did you abandon all of your, when you shifted uh, away from the character, did you abandon all of the original material? Yeah. The hardest part was to not have that blind spot. I lost 60% of my jokes. Wow. So I basically said, okay, there's like 30 or 40% that I could still get away with. Um, because they weren't so character driven, but my set was erratic and I literally called some clubs and I said, Hey, look, if it's cool with you, and instead of headlining this year, I'd love to come by twice in feature because I need long form set time. I need to practice this. I'm, I was good enough at the time to carry the 30 minutes, but it was right. erratic and I was experimenting. I didn't know what to wear. I didn't know how to act. I was doing jokes that, but yeah, I off the top, I said, I just can't do these jokes anymore because I'm not being that character. So I lost, but that was the part of the plan. I needed to jettison it. I just was terrified to do 45 yeah. minutes when you lost 60% of your act. Yeah, like, that's, you're like, okay, I'll have some ideas I'll <laughs> run with. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's frightening. To it was gut wrenching. Go. It was I, very I this, terrifying. Yeah. 12, you know, 12 years of proven material yep. that you've honed. And then all of a sudden you're going to be like, yeah, we're going to start off, you know, kind of brand new and get rid of most of that. That's I headline one time and the feature was a headliner. And I was still a hodgepodge of me. Uh, like I would say, if you saw me, you saw the skill, but it just wasn't connecting the way you'd think it should. And the feature was a headliner who was featuring and he did his big headliner closer in front of me. And I struggled to follow him. And the whole time I'm performing, I know the whole audience was going, oh, that other guy should have headlined. But I was mm. like, I cannot allow this to deter me because I know where I need to go. And if I take the pressure of headlining, it'll force me to level up and not hide. So it was, but it was, some, oh, there's some sets. I just went home going, I know what I'm doing, but my God, I'm going to go home and cry. <laughs> <laughs> That's what uh, I mean. The other guy, other guy, hey, good set. I'm like, no, it no. wasn't, but I appreciate that. Yeah. Like, but I'll get you in 10 years. And exactly. <laughs> And you know exactly why they're doing saying that to you too. Yeah, because you know, they're like because I'm bleeding. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, what was uh, the best piece of advice you received about stand-up comedy? It was from my former managers, and uh, early on, because they were stand-up comedians, and then they became managers, and they did okay. production as well. So, the best advice they told me was that that this is a long game. You're playing the long game, and how careers don't go like this. They don't plateau like that they're like this 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 so early on they burned into my brain that you and I, I'm a, I was a marathon runner so that's my mentality is you come in you pick up some speed and then when everyone's getting tired that's when now I kick it in because I understand what I'm doing uh, so that was the best advice because I knew not to look for short-term fame to understand that I had to they, they explained it to me it was like a pyramid when you start with all your peers and every year there are fewer and fewer people at your level as you go through in your career. And you'll find that by the end of your career, you're sitting up at the top of the pyramid with like 15 people of your peer group that stuck around. And you are so connected with these people because you're like, ah, we have been through hell and back mm -hmm. with each other. So that was great advice because it never made me feel like I was running out of time. I've always looked at my career as like, well, what can I do now? What What's a different thing I can do now? So maybe I let go of some of the nightclubs because it's harder to compete with some of the younger comedians, but then some clubs don't care. They let me in anyway. Uh, I've always looked at it as that it's my job to be prepared for the next phase I'm headed to. And so that way I've never felt like, you know, time has run out or I didn't get to do this. I've done a ton of stuff. I got very little regrets. <laughs> that's awesome. That's, yeah. that's really good advice for people too. It is because it's like, you know, we come in here and we think like if it doesn't happen fast, we failed. And right. they immediately said that's the opposite of a successful career in stand-up comedy because they had had a career in comedy and then transitioned to producing and teaching. So they knew that there was an arc that I had to do. So that was probably the most valuable thing to get into me early so that I didn't quit. Yeah, it's really just a, a long, long battle. I remember when I started, yeah. I was like, if I, I'm going to make it by the time I'm 40. And if I don't make it by the time I'm 40, I'm quitting. And then I, I hit 40 and I hadn't made it. Yeah. per se, but I was like, I'm having too much fun. I love this. I'm not, I'm not but I think we all do what you did. I did too. Yeah. We have this number in our head. Yeah. You know, the best thing they say is, you know, like 
when Seinfeld and those guys are like, look, I, I've been overnight success at 14 years. So we all think, oh, we've got at least 10 to 14. Then you hit that 10 to 14 year spot. Yeah. And you're like, well, I'm doing well, but I'm not Seinfeld. And Right. But yeah, but then you can be like, well, I'm enjoying myself and I pay my bills and people hire me. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess, I guess this is good. I guess I did okay. Right. You really can't compare yourself to others because you'll see, you know, yeah. uh, like when Louis C.K. was like, oh, I'm 40, I'm 42. And you're like, I'm 42 and I'm not where Louis I'm, was. Yeah. You're, you have different stresses than I do. I'm yeah, saying. you know, and you're like, you were, uh, you were doing theaters everywhere and yeah. really famous. And I know. How can I'm not there? And yeah, you just can't uh, allow yourself to play that game. It's, no. it, like but we said, all have a number. We yeah. all have a number. We all do. Yeah, I do the same thing. And then you pass that number and you realize, ah, I didn't turn into a toad. I'm good to go. <laughs> uh, exactly. I can still do it. And there's room for us. And there's venues, Vegas, cruise ships, military shows. There's so many different ways to do it. And then you never know when you might be friends with a guy that does something and then in your late fifties, get a shot at something you never thought you'd see, but you only got it because you've been here for 30 years and that's who they needed. And they needed you and you were here right. and they saw you and you're like, all right. Yeah. And you're ready for that moment. You know, yes, you, just, you were, you're like, it's we're, all about getting ready for, for that moment when it comes and then you just, you can just jump right in. So, and then if it doesn't come, you can be that bitter old funny guy at the home. I mean, <laughs> we all need that guy. The guy was chock full of regrets and anger. Exactly. Uh, so let's uh, let's go into a little bit of a uh, comedy writing. What is your what is your process when trying to come up with material? You know, now what I do is um, the smartphone really saved me because now any thought that comes to me, I just immediately start talking into the phone, mm -hmm. and uh, to the point where like if I have an idea and something says something, and then my son starts to talk, I'm like, shh, 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 shh. and then I'm like, I got to get the idea done. I'm like, okay, what can I do for you, buddy? Uh, so everything goes in talk talked out i just riff it until i can't come up with any more and then ideas and then i get up every morning and i write i go through the ideas and i decide eh, and then sometimes i pass on something and then a month later i go oh that fits or that so i try to get in the habit of doing that and then um so the combination of always throwing it down and getting up in the morning and committing to uh trying to just push ideas and then um and then i use the shows the shows are just those are like focal points for me because if I'm going to get on stage. I'm not going to waste the time. I'm working on something. I'm driving something. I commit to something. And the greatest writing for me now, because I just want to be this guy and it took me 20 years to get here uh, to write on stage. Mm -hmm. uh, I can now throw a new joke up, maybe wrote the line right before I went on and then did it. And then my buddy goes, Hey, I love that new bit. Have you thought of this? And I go, no. And then I rewrite it. And then 20 minutes later, I'm throwing it up again, completely rewritten. And then that moved it. And then on the way home, I talk and I talk into my phone again because I got new ideas. And by the time I get home, that bit is like five times better because I got two shots at it. I have someone like you saying, hey, did you think of this? Right. And then on the way home, I'm grinding it again in my head. And so that has been the greatest acceleration in my writing, committing to every idea, throwing it down, making sure I get up in the morning to at least look to form the ideas and then really not using the time. I use the time at the club to riff, banter, talk, keep myself in the wheelhouse, write it, and just trust that if, even if I scribble it on the way up, I am now capable of accessing it on stage and just mm. throwing it out however it comes out. I just don't worry about perfection anymore. That's awesome. Uh, how, how, uh, how often or how long would you say you write every day? Um, in the morning, I mean, it's not long, really. I mean, if I have a show that night, I commit to the morning to the new bits that I'm going to do. I might write for an hour and put it together and think about it. Because then over the course of the day, I'm revisiting it in my subconscious and I'm jotting it down. I'm like, oh, that's great. And I'll rehearse it a little bit. So uh, it's not like it's a scripted time. But I give myself like two hours in the morning for myself. And part of that is writing comedy. Um, or if it's not, if I don't have a show, sometimes I'll write something else, work on something else. But uh, a show day is a big day for me. That's where I really commit to writing and honing it. And now I've gotten in the habit, if it's a new bit, particularly doing Zoom shows, because you could tape the bit up above the laptop. I love that. Right. Uh, I write a whole new bit and I just typed it up because I can just <laughs> glance and pull from all my hosting experience. I'm like, I can throw it to you, glance up, pull the line. And uh, so now I've gotten into typing when I think it's, uh, enough of a bit. Like I'll do it maybe three, four times. And then once I throw it into typing uh, for me, that's kind of a subconscious trigger that this is something I'm committing to and we're going to stay on this one. And it reminds me, but then I'm such, I'm such a paper and pencil guy. I yeah. scribble 
I got books, notes. I'm like that crazy English teacher that circles and points things. <laughs> and then, so, uh, but so for me, because I'm a paper and pencil scribbler, uh, committing to typing a bit is a big jump for my brain to say, this guy has proven his worth. He's now in the typing area of my act, yeah. which means that um, when I sit down to do new bits, I go, oh, that's right. I, I, I typed that one last week and I, I remind them I'll put them together and create a set. So that keeps me focused now that I think about it. It keeps me focused on the new material because only the new material is typed. Mm. Does that make sense? Because they're the new guys. Yeah. Everything else is in my head. Right. The new stuff, I got to read it a couple of times. Go, oh, yeah. And then, yeah. So that's, and it allows you to really hone in and then edit right. and see visually and go, oh, I can, you know. I can but as I'm talking to you, I realize how laborious and how much repetition this is. But that's because it makes it stick in my head so that I can do it. But it's not efficient at all. But well, that's, but that's how, but kind of how you do it. It's commitment yeah. to show you. Well, that's like when I would uh, when people say, "How do you memorize like your your set or whatever?" Um, especially when when it's a longer bit, I would do you know remember suicides from like uh, Jim where you oh, yeah. from like yeah. line to the key and Hated that's what I would do with my act. Yeah, As if I need to remember like a long set or something uh, when I'm trying to you know first put something together, that's what I'll do is I'll do the first bit and then I'll do the first bit, second bit, first bit, second yeah. bit, third bit, and then just. Yeah, Keep, and again, it's very laborious and very tedious, but, it, but, it, but it's it how, yeah, how, how it burns it in. You're yeah. right, and uh, and I I just you know I just it's uh, I, I have had more fun writing new material doing these Zoom shows because mm -hmm. it's right there. Yeah. And my son came in and he looks at the seven. He goes, "Oh, you're cheating!" Like it's not cheating. That's like, <laughs> like a cue card. It's, it's cheating. It's not a test. I wrote it. I know that's my stuff. That's right. Um, you, you also mentioned something which I think is really uh, kind of important to hit on. When you go on stage, have a goal, have a purpose. There's so many people on I see, especially at like open mics or, yeah. or just whatever, you know, shows Thursday, Friday, Saturday, whatever. And they go up and they do the, uh, what else do I want to talk about? And, yeah. uh, and they just kind of goof around. And it's like you said, that stage time is gold. Like don't. Yeah. To me, uh, a point of concentration is accountability accountability. If you say you're going to do something, then you got to hold yourself accountable. Uh, so I think a lot of comedians back off that because then they don't have to be accountable to anything. You're just mm -hmm. jumping up and having fun. And we all love that. And you need those sets. Sometimes I'm like, I'm so, you know what? I'm just going to go up tonight, do my best of plug into the room. And that's my drug. And that right. makes me happy. But 99% of the time I have a point of concentration, whether it's slow down on this bit, um, open up differently, um, work on this new bit, uh, try this, you know, there's a lot, there's always something. And I've really learned that it can be insignificant, but that doesn't mean it's, a, it's still something that I need to master and work on. And so mm -hmm. even if the idea is just slow down in your opening, you know, and if I get multiple sets in a night, I learn faster because I can do it, screw it up, nail it the second time. So I think the point of concentration is so important to have, and it makes it makes you value the stage time because we say it's valuable and it is right. gold. But uh, it, you have to value it if you say to yourself, "I'm going to do this. I'm trying this tonight." Tell your friends what you're going to do. Yeah, tonight I'm working on this bit, or I'm trying to do this. Will you watch me? And then have your friends hold you accountable that you mm. respect too. That adds a double level of accountability, and then but then you get encouragement from each other. You know, so right. yeah, that's super important. And I wish. You know, when I first started, I didn't have this. I was all about doing my best stuff and always looking like I knew what I was doing, terrified to fail. And I had to do that for years until I realized, man, you need to loosen up your grip on this. Otherwise, you're never going to grow. Hmm. That's really, that's great advice for people. So hopefully if you're a comic and you're listening. Yeah, do what I did. Be a perfectionist for 10 years. Exactly. And stress well, out and drink too much and then let it go after that. And then, well, then life is good. Yeah. It's, well, I think it's hard because it's true, you want to do well. You know, yes. you don't want... Because that pain, you go through that pain, especially in the beginning where it's just you're inconsistent, you bomb, and you just yep. feel like crap, and you're whatever. And then finally you start to like, okay, I'm getting the hang of it. You get consistent. Then you start getting good, yeah. and then you're like, okay, I like this. I don't want to feel this pain anymore. And I, I'm and, guilty and of that. that well. And I got to that place, and then when I stopped doing the characters the first time, I realized that my survivability as a comedian depended on me not doing well. Mm. And that's when I physicalized discomfort on stage really for the first time because I had I realized I had no choice I can't stay doing the character and be afraid I gotta go out there and take it on the chin so that really helped me and then you know, it took me like what 15 17 years before I was comfortable 
writing on stage where you're so comfortable, like no matter what happens, you're like, well, you guys have been horrible. But that line that I got out, you laughed at, that's a keeper. I'm going to make money off that line. And I've walked into rooms that ate me alive and I'm in such a good mood. I go, dude, I threw a new bit out. And the only bit that worked was that one. You know how good this new yep. bit is? When my act <laughs> yeah. was dying and they didn't like me, but I still sold the new bit. I'm like, I am going home. I'm the man. I'm the yeah. man. So um, we talk about bad shows. What is your worst show uh, that you've ever had? Oh, so many to choose from. <laughs> and, um, you know, I thought about that because, you know, the word traditional. My new definition of a worst show is mm -hmm. not. I mean, I've been eaten alive like everyone else. I'll tell you, I'll give you two different versions of bad shows, okay? Okay. The first one is San Francisco Comedy Competition. A lot of my worst shows were San Francisco Comedy Competitions because I was new, but I was good enough to make the finals, but I wasn't good enough to have any adjustment ability. Didn't have the skills, didn't have the material. So I got eaten alive a lot of times at these super big venues. Uh, one of them was a venue that the year before I had killed. It was a nightclub kind of volo, but for some reason I locked in. I was so confident going into the finals in this one in Monterey. I had to follow Ralphie May and Vinny Favorito back oh, to back. Geez. Just monster, blue, hard hitting. Yeah. They destroyed this place. <laughs> and I went up behind him and ate it. And they hated me. I was booed during my set, but you had to do 17 minutes to qualify for the set, right? So for 17 minutes, I was hated and verbally just booed. And then at the end of the night, no, I was the last guy to go that night. At the end, then they call you back up in the order that you finished. So with the blood still dripping from their teeth, <laughs> they called you back up in fifth place to which the it was so audibly mean and people just like scream. And, that, and then for some reason, I don't know what happened. It seemed like it took a while to bring up the fourth guy. <laughs> I, was, I felt like I was being thrown out as a crucifixion. It was horrible. Horrible experience. Um, and I drove home. Just I was that shamed. I was beaten. I was like, who calls me back? I was getting booed a moment before. And you brought them back out to go, in case you got some hatred left in your heart. <laughs> One so, more time. Okay. But my new bad show would be um, when I have a huge career opportunity. And for some reason, I tighten up a little bit. Mm -hmm. Because those are, the, those are the ones. Everything else, I accept stand-up comedy. But when you have a major career opportunity and something happens... And I still get momentarily tight and it affects the set. So the set goes from a really good set, not a great set, but a really good set. And that difference when you're competing like an America's Got Talent, last comic, standing huge opportunities, the difference between the comic doesn't do as well as me, but was open and connected the whole time. That person moves on. Mm. The comic that momentarily tightens and freezes a little bit and has that hesitation, you create doubt. So then I had a couple of career opportunities where I pulled myself out of it. But that that upfront moment where you're not communicating that openness that you got this, that that has undone me. Now, in America's Got Talent, I passed the first round, but it wasn't a big enough hit that I didn't get come to the second round. And then same thing, last comic standing audition. It was just the, the host before me wasn't doing what he's supposed to do. They're supposed to bring people up. Right. He was riffing between comics. And right before me, he did a riff made a real blue reference to someone. The crowd was like, ooh, and horror. And then they brought me up, mm -hmm. and I didn't take the time like I would if it wasn't a showcase. I should have connected to what happened and just wasted that first 30 seconds on connection. Not a waste. It would have been the perfect move. Instead, I tried to launch into my TV set, and it right. just it created a wall. And that first 30 seconds, it just was a not connection. And I got so angry. I was like, there's no way with my level of experience that I'm going to die in this room. And I pulled it out, but it didn't matter because the first thing you saw was a guy <laughs> go, ah! yeah. <laughs> and then you saw, oh, good. He's got some skills and he's funny, but he's not going to make the show. Well, and I think that's something um, that I, I'm sometimes guilty of as well is one of the things they're looking for is how do you handle everything? You know, because if you're on live television, yeah. Things are going to happen, and are you going to melt down on live television, or are you going to yeah. be able to calmly adjust and go, well, that was weird, and continue? Yeah. And and the thing that hurts me the most is that is one of my greatest skills, hmm. is that ability yeah. to just go with it and open up. And yet, in those moments, I would still be so focused on executing what I thought was this perfect set that I put together uh, that in the moment I should have chosen to go to trust me 
Instead, I trusted the material, and that's a horrible mistake because we are we are the superpower, not the material. We are the yeah. human. The comedian is the savior, not the material. Is great, but it's us. It's us they're looking for. So, yeah, it's it's funny. And I'm, I'm not better. I'm not better. No, not at all. No. Uh, I, I think I shared this on the, the podcast before, but uh, when I filmed my dry bar special, mm -hmm. um, I usually go out before and, you know, view everything and um, where they filmed, we filmed some pre, you know, pre stuff. Right. And then when I went back out, the layout had kind of changed, the lights were different, you know, on and, and my brain just went, I, I tightened up, you know, a little bit and my brain was like, oh, look, there's the cameraman, there's another cameraman, there's right. another camera, you know, and, and I was in my head. Just kind of going, wow. And again, it just affects the beginning of yeah. that set. And I was just and like, it's not bad. It's no. just, you know, that had you walked out, <clears throat> plugged in with that little glimmer in your eye. Yeah. It would have just been like this effortless beginning. And you do it, you don't have to be funny. You just have yeah. to be present. Right. And that was, uh, you know, and I, I, I skipped, I forgot my second joke, which then threw me completely out of rhythm. And right. I'm like, what am I? What am I? And then my second show, I was like, there's no way on earth that that's right. happening again. And I just kind of plowed through. And, and that's, I think, true of most comics. If you give us two shows, yeah. you're really going to see us do two, two, do it twice. Because the first one eats us alive if we yeah. do it. You get back. And I don't care how bad the audience is. I'm having the greatest show of my life. Exactly. And that's what they, they even say that. They're like, yeah, you know, that's most comics do. struggle. And that's why they do it. That's why when people film specials, they do a whole right. weekend. You know, so it's, right. well, it's not this one shot, you know, deal. Yeah. So, although uh, I take I take my second CD on a one shot deal, and at the time I didn't think it was a big deal. Like, well, that was kind of a that's kind of a roll of the dice, go yeah. in one shot, one take, just go mm -hmm. as it is. I'm like, it worked out fine, but I was like, that was I wouldn't recommend it. It's stressful. So uh, a lot of comics uh, they start to, to they or they think they're ready, and they go up to LA or they uh, or they go to New York, and or some people just go, you know what, I'm going to go to LA because that's where you go to to. Mm -hmm. you know, to be seen. What is the LA, <clears throat> excuse me, what is the LA scene like? Well, you know, I'm kind of an anomaly. I started in LA. I didn't mm -hmm. know that you had any option. I lived out here and I, and people always, I've, I didn't meet too many people that started here. So for me, the LA scene, I've, I've always like, I've been in different pockets of it. I never pipelined into the Hollywood. You know, I did shows at the improv. I was fortunate enough to get passed by Bud Friedman before he stopped doing the day to day. So at least I, put that feather in my old school cap. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I really, you know, I didn't work. The, the Sunset Strip clubs weren't a big, good fit for me. You know, at the time I was in a character, I worked clean. And so I never, not that I couldn't know, but I emotionally didn't feel at home there. So um, so for me, the, the LA scene has always been like, you know, I've been working the Ice House Comedy Magic Club, Flap. I've worked all the clubs in and around and a lot mm -hmm. of smaller venues, but I've been here for 25 years. And so, um, you know, I know people talk about LA versus New York and I love going to New York and jumping on stage there too, just to feel the different vibe. But, uh, I, my biggest thing in LA was that this is not, this is natural for me. So I don't really know what to compare it to because people mm -hmm. come here and I go, well, I've been here. But, uh, when I see people come from other cities it used to blow me away, you know, 15 year veterans who were kind of a big deal where they came from. And then you'd see them sitting out on the sidewalk, trying to get to three minutes at the laugh factory. And I'm like, welcome to LA. Yeah. Welcome to the LA comedy scene. It is very competitive and very brutal. And my advice to everyone is if a club says yes to you, then that's your home club. And maybe you wanted it to be the improv, but guess what? You got this one too. And stage time is stage time and growth is growth. And you might end up at the improv later, but you know, it's like, if you get a club here in LA to green light you and give you regular stage time, you've done a great job. And when you get two and three, you know, you're a very, very fortunate individual, but just one that's committed to you. Like you can pick up a couple spots a week and then you can sprinkle it in with your, you know, once a month at the Laugh Factory or once a month at the Ice House too, right. or once a month at the Comedy Magic Club. But then you get that one club that's like, no, you call in every week. We'll get you on stage two, three times a week. And then that's, that's like, I mean, that's the gold standard as far as I'm concerned, because uh, mm. then you get so comfortable at one club and you can take that everywhere else. Nice. Um, now, in addition to, to doing clubs, one of the things that you're, you're really good at uh, is doing corporate work. You do a lot of corporate shows. How did you get involved uh, doing corporate? Uh, you know, I started doing, I mean, I do stand up at corporate, but my kind of wheelhouse has always been hosting events like mm -hmm. award shows, multi-day meetings, all kinds of stuff. 
And uh, I actually started hosting corporate while I was a mobile DJ, a disc jockey, before I did stand up. I actually started yeah. corporate hosting. I think I did a corporate hosting gig before I did my groundbreaking bridal shower. Um, <laughs> but first, uh, the company that I worked for was a mobile entertainment company. And the guy that ran it was trying to branch out to do corporate gigs, right? And um, so he pitched it to a company and he pitched the idea of like a Max Headroom style character in another room, green screen, floating head, head comes up on the screen, co-host the meeting, we'll have cameras so the guy can see what's going on. He pitches it to the guy. The guy says he loves it. And then he asks me if I can do that. <laughs> I'm like, ah, I can do that. So prosthetics, everything. I'm in the other room. I can see. So I hosted my first two, three gigs as a floating head <laughs> that could riff with the audience, right? See what's mm -hmm. going on, work the speakers. And then somebody hired me and said, well, we'd like you to host it just as you. And I was like, well, geez, I've never done that. I never just come out as me. I was always doing a character. So, and then I started. So I actually started my stand-up and corporate hosting started simultaneously. Hmm. And so um, then I really got lucky in that one of my college buddies, after we both graduated, we were in LA, and he happened to be an account executive for a, like the largest corporate communications company in the world. They handle all the big accounts. And and he, um, you know, we were just talking, and I told him I was a comedian, and he said, well, you know, I work for this company. We use talent all the time. And so he submitted a sheet that said he saw me in a club. They, I, they should look at me. And so they called me in and I auditioned and I got a gig. And so that's how I get into these companies. So it was really just kind of an organic thing that just happened simultaneously. And so I started learning about this whole world of corporate entertainment that coexisted where comedians and hosts, you know, get to do these amazing things. And so, uh, yeah, I've been very fortunate that the two have lived, they coexist. And now when I merged my act and myself together, mm -hmm. now, that guy goes from nightclub to corporate awards banquet and I can do both. And so, and one doesn't stop the other. And so I know how to adjust myself. I don't really have to adjust myself. When you're in an environment, I know not to swear or say something because I, I, I don't feel it. Right. When you're in a club, not that I do, but if it comes out, it comes out. Who cares? There, it matters. It matters right. a lot. You can't say it. Yeah. It's a, it'll, it'll get fired. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, jobs are on the line there. So that, yes, that brings so up an interesting. Line, right? That I mean, that brings up a really interesting um, point because uh, I I do some corporate work, I do uh, church work, and that sort of. And right. churches are, are similar too. Like it's yeah. it's it's pretty big, uh, you know, crowds and business, and yeah. and um, they will research you. And so, yeah. how do you handle having your uh, as far as what you put out there, as far as material right. online for people to see? Um, I think I, I talked about this uh, and I teach a class as a, one of the comedy comes about corporate uh, stuff. You know, I am conscious of it. Now, I had to, I've been doing this for 25 years. I've been hosting corporate events for over 20. I have never had anyone give me a note for language in my life, right? It wouldn't even dawn on me. It's not even in my wheelhouse when I'm there. Somebody just hired me and the producer sent me a note that said, by the way, client loves you but they saw some of your videos online and wanted to remind you to keep it clean. And I said to the president, I've never in my life <laughs> has anyone even said that to me, but there's a stand-up clip on my website in which I say two words that you really couldn't say. And, and I don't need them in the bit, but I have them on the tape. So it didn't cost me anything, but it made the client. So yes, people will research. You have to be conscious, I think, of what brand you're selling. If you're a comic that does comedy and you don't have, you don't care, it will have an impact at some point. And not that you should edit yourself at all. I would never suggest that. But if you are someone who works clean predominantly and you want to market yourself to churches or companies or places, you know, you should have a tape that you send them that's appropriate. They will probably find something somewhere out there if they really dug deep enough. And if that's really going to make them offensive, then my uh, my suggestion is you probably wouldn't want to work for them anyway because mm -hmm. if they were that concerned about you if anything goes wrong you're dead better to hire someone that they feel confident about but it's it's a reality that we have to live with uh just like anybody who applies for a job you know the, mm -hmm. the new company can research you so if you really go for the freedom of speech and you really don't care what you say then you 
you're probably taking yourself out of the game for a lot of corporate gigs. Hmm. Yeah. What um I guess what what are some of the uh some of the things that people um may or may not think about when performing at a corporate setting? Um that it is 100% about them. You are in their world, they hired you there and I think as your job as the host and comedian is to plug into their reality because they didn't come to the club. You came to the meeting. You came to their awards banquet. It is about them. My brain is focused on what we have in common, the experience that we have that's universal, the things that I'm seeing in front of them. So I don't, it's not about me. How I respond and react to their environment, that's why you bring me in because I'm not going to agree with everything I see and I'm, I'm there to speak my mind and have fun with it. But I think that comedians that need to understand that, you know, there's rules, there's, there's a box you got to stay inside of. Mm -hmm. And you can either choose to feel restricted or you can take the MacGyver approach and go, okay, I got a spatula and I got a deck of cards. I got to go and I got to make something happen with these two. Or you can say, oh, if I only had my fire hose, dude, I could have done my closing bit. Yeah, right. but you didn't get it. So it's a mentality of given with what you have to play with, how creative can you be? And I found that I'm more creative when restricted because it just pops out of you. And you have great time because you're looking – it forces me to hyper focus on their world mm -hmm. and I find stuff as opposed to going in thinking I have to do this bit or I can't do this. Then my mind is now in a different reality. So my advice is just plug in and look at the possibilities and you will find the thing that is funny that you should have fun with. And the mm -hmm. company will love you because you plugged into their world. And, and, and you're a fish out of water and you'll see something they never saw. And my favorite line I've ever done at a corporate event, there's a high tech company, one of the biggest tech summits every year. I worked for them for like 10 years and they had this thing outside their, their convention called the Mobility Center, right? Mm -hmm. And I had to remind everybody, after we're done here today, please visit the Mobility Center. And in a moment of complete irony, tomorrow, the mobility center will be located in the exact same location. <laughs> Such a stupid joke, but for their world, like, of course it's the mobility center. Cause it means this, 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 and this. And I was like, it doesn't move. That makes me happy. So stupidest line ever, but that one that's stuck. Yeah. <laughs> so that, but that's what you got to look for. In my opinion, look for the toys, different set of toys, different set of skills, same comedy. Yeah. And how do you find, um, obviously you want to respect, the uh the company and their their process and yeah. do do a lot of them ask for your material up front do they tell you kind of like because they're paranoid that yeah. you know um i always tell comedians and i don't ever i will never submit anything before that mm -hmm. just doesn't work out it's not you're hiring me that's the risk you're assuming you can watch my tapes i'll get on the phone with you uh, we can discuss areas, stay away from, I'll honor whatever you got to do. But if you let the client edit your words, they're not comics. And I've been told one time I had a horrible experience. This is why I learned this. Uh, I was doing it for a huge pharmaceutical company. They set up a late night show and uh, I had a band, thousand people. I was so excited. And the producer was new. And of course, and you'll, you'll get this a lot. The mm -hmm. comedian before me had ruined everything. Mm -hmm. And so this year they were nervous. So the client came to the producer and said that she wanted to review the five minute monologue that I was going to do. And I told the producer, I said, well, I have an idea. I haven't really nailed it. I usually nail it the night before, you know, I'll choose based on blah, 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 blah. And she goes, oh, okay. But they really want to say, yeah, it's not a good idea for them to see the jokes. I said, I, I promise. I said, you know, I'm not, this is my process. So then she came back with the client and cornered me and they said, she really wants to see it. And I felt stuck. So I said, I'll tell you what, I'll walk through a couple of the opening lines so you get a feel. I thought that'd be a decent compliment. So the producer and the client go to the back of the ballroom. There's 1,500 empty seats between us. <laughs> they introduce me. I walk out on stage. I say hello. I do the first two lines. They go, you know, just stuff like that, blah, 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 blah. They walk back. They come over to me, and the client's like, well, that doesn't make any sense. They're not going to, why would they do that? And she just went off on why this was not going to work. And they told me not to do it. So I went back to my hotel room that night and I'm like, no, I know exactly what I'm doing. The reason I'm choosing this material is because it is perfect. I'm the comedian. I went out the next morning, 1,500 people. I opened with exactly the same material they told me not to do. Not because it was offensive. 
she just didn't understand comedy. Right. And it, it destroyed. And as soon as I got off stage, she ran back ecstatic. Oh my God, that was so amazing. That's exactly what we wanted. And I thought, okay, <laughs> you have to have the confidence to know that you are the expert. Okay. You don't make the neurosurgeon review procedure with you where you're there. That's not how it works. Right. Now you pick the right guy and you got a little bit of faith. So I never do it. And if they insist, then I will say, you know what? This is probably not a good fit then because I'm not going to subject myself to that process. Uh, so, and I've really only had issue with maybe one client, one hmm. out of all who really was not happy with that. But then when I did it, they loved what I did, but they still didn't like that. I wouldn't give it to them ahead of time. So it's not a corporate memo. It's not something that the team's going to run together and go, we think you should say Bush instead of shrubbery. Like you right. can't do that. You just can't do that. Right. At least that's well, what I said. <laughs> There's okay. probably people going, oh, you're going to my company. You yeah, say, well, yeah. no, but if you give me the teleprompter, you want me to read the script? You know, if I think it's stupid, I'll say, hey, you know what? I have an idea. Can I rewrite this joke? I offer that or I'll just, they won't let me. I just add live it on the fly because, you know, what works, works. Well, well, at that point, they can't, you know. Right. You, and then, but then they learn, okay, <clears throat> the reason they brought him in is because he can see a line and come up with a better thing for it. And it adds to our event. Uh, but when you do it ahead of time, sometimes you're seen as someone who's, you know, just do what we wrote yeah. because we've passed it around the meeting and it's been approved. I'm like, well, okay, but I'm a comic and I think I have a better joke. Right. And I, I, <laughs> again, <clears throat> excuse me, they're just doing it because they're, they're worried about their job. Yes. And that's, you know? the, that's a huge point. And I always, and I, someone wants it to go well. And your job is to alleviate their anxiety. Your job is to make them look good. Your job is to make them enjoy this event so much because they brought you in, right? Yes, you're 100% right. Yeah. But there is a level with which you cannot let the client's anxiety trample on what you do because then you serve no one's needs. You don't serve the client's needs. So I guess what I'm saying is when push comes to shove, you need to honor what they say, language restrictions, topic restrictions, please don't do this. It's all, that's their right. But the words that you choose to express yourself, if it's not foul, I mean, it's, it's really, that's what you're there for. And you got to trust your Jedi powers. Yeah. There have been times I just say, look, you know, <clears throat> I want this to, <clears throat> and I'll actually say it. I, I want you to look good. Yeah, you want to go well. You know, and, you know, yeah. and, I, and I, I've said, because I, I had something, they, they wanted me to do a, a Zoom show. Um, and they were like, for, for the same amount of money that I was supposed to, that they were going to fly me out for. And I was like... I don't think that you're going to get your money's worth um, within a Zoom show. Like there's a difference, you know, like we'll just postpone it and we'll do it, you know, beginning of next year. I'm fine with that. But you just come up and just say, look, I, I want you to make sure you get your money's worth and right. that uh, I make you look good and everybody's happy. So I had this conversation with a client. I had to price something out and I just said I had to look at what it would call live and I just adjusted for my experience level and what it would do. And I said, I want this to be so I want to do it. And I agree with you. I said, I, I don't I want. You know, we have to learn what the worth is mm. when you do this format. It definitely has value. Definitely, we can do stuff. But yeah, I think there's an adjustment for that too. But uh, it is, it is, it rarely ever happens though. I mean, people hire you to do comedy and they're happy to have you. Yep. And they just say, please, you know, we're going to have kids in the audience or please don't use this word. It's usually that simple. Uh, every now and then they'll say, if they tell me, whatever you do, don't don't talk to the president of the company. <laughs> they, you can't do that to me yeah. because I walked into the room and I was like, guy seems so cool. Like, why is everybody afraid of the president? And uh, I did one where I talked to the guy. I did one where we were in the, in the, in the Iraq doing shows in the Middle East and we had to do like a 10 a.m. show. And we went, it was, like a, it was like a joint command headquarters where all the seats were scaled from top to bottom like a Planet of the Apes tribunal. And we were at the very bottom. So the, all these guys are looking down at us mm -hmm. and uh, and everyone was nervous and no, it just they were, were we were interrupting like the war. They made them close their laptops. It was like generals and, and colonels and it was very intimidating. And we were below these guys and uh, and I had to go. I volunteered to go first. I'm like, no, I, I know what to do. And so I started off. I asked who the senior ranking officer in the room was and some guy raised his hand and I walked right up to him and I said, I thought you'd be taller. <laughs> and it just, it just, it popped the bubble. Everybody was like, right. he looked at me like, and I just walked away like a bullfighter that had just turned his back on a bull. And it was like, <laughs> cause that in that moment needed something like that. So right. in, in corporate, there's always authority 
And a lot of times people are afraid of stuff and you realize, oh, okay, that's their fear. But the president is looking at me like, come on, he's, you know, so you yeah. really have to, you gotta you just, you know, trust your judgment. And if they're really nervous, obviously stay away. But sometimes, you know, they just don't want to deal with if it goes wrong, but you have a playful banter with the president and suddenly it's, it's a glorious moment that you would have missed if you had just like fearfully tiptoed around, you can tell when you're headed down yeah. the wrong path. <laughs> it's, it's really obvious. Well, and then it also makes it uh, okay for everybody else to laugh because yes. they yes. see they see the boss laughing, and so they go, "Oh." And, he's and you know what? Nine times out of ten, whoever he or she is, the boss can handle themselves. Mm -hmm. And when the boss pushes back, it's comedy gold. You know, I said something before, and I forget. She was in charge and she just said, I haven't signed your check yet. And the place went nuts. <laughs> and then I had to backpedal comedically. And we yeah. set up a perfect example of who really holds the power in the room. And that's that's because she she's it's her company. Do you right. think she's gonna let a comic? No, you gotta <laughs> trust these people. That's great. Uh, all, all sorts of really good information. Uh, we're going to wrap it up in just a, a minute, but uh, I wanted to talk a little but first. bit. <laughs> but first, uh, there's there's an organization that uh, you are um, a, a big supporter of, and we want to talk about that a little bit. It is the uh, Armed Services Arts Partnerships. Yeah, they are a wonderful organization. They're a nonprofit. I think they're based out of Hampton Roads, Virginia. They're out on the East Coast. Uh, it's really a wonderful organization. I'm a former Marine infantry officer. And um, Armed Services Arts Partnership, they provide artistic opportunities for military veterans and families to uh, deal with a lot of uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome or just assimilation, dealing with a lot of issues, helping them assimilate back into society through the arts. They have acting, they have uh, storytelling, but, but stand-up comedy is the prime vehicle and they do shows and they allow these veterans to express themselves in ways that you know society would feel uncomfortable. But if you do it on stage, you get it's captive audience and listen mm -hmm. they perform for the white house i'm on the artist council there so it's a really wonderful organization uh, they're doing zoom shows now on fridays they get like they're getting celebrity comedians at the end and all their uh performer graduates they do comedy boot camp and comedy classes it's really really wonderful organization uh the armed services arts partnership so it's really a privilege because if that had existed when i started i would have been thrilled uh, you know, as a veteran coming back in, trying to assimilate into, I went from being a Marine uh, officer in Desert Storm to try to assimilate into the world of civilians through by karaoke and comedy. So I really had a real, it was, it was, not, it was, a, it was a rough transition, but uh, so these guys do great work, all levels too. I mean, all age groups and they have comedian, they have comedians who are the parents from the military. So the kid comes to really, broaden it out to the whole military community and they're growing and they're huge East coast presence, but they're trying to have a West coast presence now. Um, so check them out. They do really good work and really talented comics too. I did a show in DC and I had like three of them on the undercard and I was dying. And I was like, Oh, this is so refreshing to listen mm. to these people with a unique set of skills and experiences. Just be brutally honest in a comedic way. You are like, Oh, this is awesome. Yeah, that's that's a that's a great and you can uh, check out their site. It's uh, www.asapasap.org. A S A P A S A P dot org. Uh, yeah, that's that's actually yeah, that's not Brian. And I talk about. It looks like someone made a mistake. Yeah, but it's ASAP. <laughs> ASAP. It's not just one. You got to do it twice. So yeah. so ASAP ASAP dot org, and that's the Armed Services Arts Partnership. And uh, definitely check them out and definitely check, uh, check out uh, James P. Connolly. You can find him on Instagram at James P. Connolly, C-O-N-N-O-L-L-Y, and Facebook at James P. Connolly Official. Oh, it's official. Oh, the other one's very unofficial. Facebook is official. And yeah, then please, uh, yeah, please stop by. And I'm doing some, uh, I will do, uh, I have another one coming up. The Zoom shows are in the ethereal comedy world. So yeah, come by the website. Uh, jamespconley.tv and uh, shows are listed and love to have you come. All you got to do is go on your couch for God's <laughs> sakes. It's like you can expend the same amount of energy as watching your kids do a talent show. That's how easy it is for us now. But more talent. Well, yeah, well <laughs> kids, in most kids, cases. Some of these kids are phenomenal. Uh, I don't have kids so I don't know. Uh, I'll, I get the, I'll get the hate mail. That's fine. He's right there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> He's talented. Well, 
There you go. So, uh, James, thank you so much for, for taking the time today and uh, thank uh, the viewers and listeners for, for tuning in. Uh, looking forward to uh, getting back out there and uh, seeing you soon. If there's anything I can do to help with uh, ASAP ASAP or anything else that you, you got going on, please let me know and love having cool. you. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. It's great to see you. It'll be nice to see you in the flesh sometime soon. Absolutely. Yeah. Although, right. although I got to say, I do like my living room. <laughs> it's, a, it's a fun, it's a, it's a fun uh, work it's space. Been, yeah, it's been, I got I got one well, there. Dogs doing stand up comedy in my living room. That's what I. Absolutely. All right. Thanks again to James P. Connolly, and thanks to you guys for tuning in, and we will uh, catch you next time. Thanks again.